section forty six of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli royal proclamations the satires and the comedies of the age have been consulted by the historian of our manners and the features of the times have been traced from those amusing records of folly danes barrington enlarged this field of domestic history in his very entertaining observations on the statutes another source which to me seems not to have been explored is the proclamations which have frequently issued from our sovereigns and were produced by the exigencies of the times these proclamations or royal edicts in our country were never armed with the force of laws only as they enforce the execution of laws already established and the proclamation of a british monarch may become even an illegal act if it be in opposition to the law of the land once indeed it was enacted under the arbitrary government of henry the eighth by the sanction of a pusillanimous parliament that the force of acts of parliament should be given to the king's proclamations and at a much later period the chancellor lord ellesmere was willing to have advanced the king's proclamations into laws on the sophistical maxim that all precedents had a time when they began but this chancellor argued ill as he was told with spirit by lord coke in the presence of james the first footnote the whole story is in twelve coke seven forty six i owe this curious fact to the author of eunomus to one hundred and sixteen end of footnote who probably did not think so ill of the chancellor's logic blackstone to whom on this occasion i could not fail to turn observes on the statute under henry the eighth that it would have introduced the most despotic tyranny and must have proved fatal to the liberties of this kingdom had it not been luckily repealed in the minority of his successor whom he elsewhere calls an amiable prince all our young princes we discover were amiable blackstone has not recorded the subsequent attempt of the lord chancellor under james the first which tended to raise proclamations to the nature of a ukase of the autograph of both the russias it seems that our national freedom notwithstanding our ancient constitution has had several narrow escapes royal proclamations however in their own nature are innocent enough for since the manner time and circumstances of putting laws in execution must frequently be left to the discretion of the executive magistrate a proclamation that is not adverse to existing laws need not create any alarm the only danger they incur is that they seem never to have been attended to and rather testified the wishes of the government than the compliance of the subjects they were not laws and were therefore considered as sermons or pamphlets or anything forgotten in a week's time these proclamations are frequently alluded to by the letter-writers of the times among the news of the day but usually their royal virtue hardly kept them alive beyond the week some on important subjects are indeed noticed in our history many indications of the situation of affairs the feelings of the people and the domestic history of our nation may be drawn from these singular records i have never found them to exist in any collected form and they have been probably only accidentally preserved Footnote a quarto volume was published by barker the king's printer and is entitled a book of proclamations published since the beginning of his majesty's most happy reign over england until this present month of february sixteen hundred and nine 
it contains one hundred and ten in all the society of antiquaries of london possesses at the present time the largest and most perfect collection of royal proclamations in existence brought together since the above was written they are on separate broad sheets as issued End of footnote the proclamations of every sovereign would characterize his reign and open to us some of the interior operations of the cabinet the despotic will yet vacillating conduct of henry the eighth towards the close of his reign may be traced in a proclamation to abolish the translations of the scriptures and even the reading of bibles by the people commanding all printers of english books and pamphlets to affix their names to them and forbidding the sale of any english books printed abroad footnote in fifteen twenty nine the king had issued a proclamation for resisting and withstanding of most damnable heresies sown within the realm of the disciples of luther and other heretics perverters of christ's religion in june fifteen thirty this was followed by the proclamation for damning or condemning of erroneous books and heresies and prohibiting the having of holy scripture translated into the vulgar tongues of english french or dutch he notes many books printed beyond the sea which he will not allow that is to say the book called the wicked mamana the book named the obedience of a christian man the supplication of beggars and the book called the revelation of antichrist the summary of scripture and divers other books made in the english tongue in fact all books in the vernacular not issued by native printers and that having respect to the malignity of this present time with the inclination of people to erroneous opinions the translation of the new testament and the old into the vulgar tongue of english should rather be the occasion of continuance or increase of errors among the said people than any benefit or commodity toward the weal of their souls and he determines therefore that the scriptures shall only be expounded to the people as heretofore and that these books be clearly exterminate and exiled out of this realm of england for ever when the people were not suffered to publish their opinions at home all the opposition flew to foreign presses and their writings were then smuggled into the country in which they ought to have been printed hence many volumes printed in a foreign type at this period are found in our collections the king shrunk in dismay from that spirit of reformation which had only been a party business with him and making himself a pope decided that nothing should be learnt but what he himself deigned to teach the antipathies and jealousies which are populous too long indulged by their incivilities to all foreigners are characterized by a proclamation issued by mary commanding her subjects to behave themselves peaceably towards the strangers coming with king philip that noblemen and gentlemen should warn their servants to refrain from strife and contention either by outward deeds taunting words unseemly countenance by mimicking them etc the punishment not only her grace's displeasure but to be committed to prison without bail or main prize the proclamations of edward the sixth curiously exhibit the unsettled state of the reformation where the rites and ceremonies of catholicism were still practised by the new religionists while an opposite party resolutely bent on an eternal separation from rome were avowing doctrines which afterwards consolidated themselves into puritanism and while others were hatching up that demoralizing fanaticism which subsequently shocked the nation with those monstrous sects the indelible disgrace of our country in one proclamation the king denounces to the people those who despise the sacrament by calling it idol or such other vile name another is against such as innovate any ceremony and who are described as certain private preachers and other laymen who rashly attempt of their own and singular wit and mind not only to persuade the people from the old and accustomed rites and ceremonies but also themselves bring in new and strange orders according to their fantasies 
the which as it is an evident token of pride and arrogancy so it tendeth both to confusion and disorder another proclamation to press a godly conformity throughout his realm where we learn the following curious fact of divers unlearned and indiscreet priests of a devilish mind and intent teaching that a man may forsake his wife and marry another his first wife yet living likewise that the wife may do the same to the husband others that a man may have two wives or more at once for that these things are not prohibited by god's law but by the bishop of rome's law so that by such evil and fantastical opinions some have not been afraid indeed to marry and keep two wives here as in the bud we may unfold those subsequent scenes of our story which spread out in the following century the branching out of the nonconformists into their various sects and the indecent haste of our reformed priesthood who in their zeal to cast off the yoke of rome desperately submitted to the liberty of having two wives or more there is a proclamation to abstain from flesh on fridays and saturdays exhorted on the principle not only that men should abstain on those days and forbear their pleasures and the meats wherein they had more delight to the intent to subdue their bodies to the soul and spirit but also for worldly policy to use fish for the benefit of the commonwealth and profit of many who be fishers and men using that trade unto the which this realm in every part environed with the seas and so plentiful of fresh waters be increased the nourishment of the land by saving flesh it did not seem to occur to the king and council that the butchers might have had cause to petition against this monopoly of two days in the week granted to the fishmongers and much less that it was better to let the people eat flesh or fish as suited their conveniency in respect to the religious rite itself it was evidently not considered as an essential point of faith since the king enforces it on the principle for the profit and commodity of his realm burnet has made a just observation on religious fasts a proclamation against excess of apparel in the reign of elizabeth and renewed many years after shows the luxury of dress which was indeed excessive footnote in june fifteen seventy four the queen issued from her manor of greenwich this proclamation against excess of apparel and the superfluity of unnecessary foreign wares thereto belonging which is declared to have grown by sufferance to such an extremity that the manifest decay not only of a great part of the wealth of the whole realm generally is like to follow by bringing into the realm such superfluities of silks clothes of gold silver and other most vain devices of so great cost for the quantity thereof as of necessity the monies and treasure of the realm is and must be yearly conveyed out of the same this is followed by three folio leaves minutely describing what may be worn on the dresses of every grade of persons descending to such minutia as to note what classes are not to be allowed to put lace or fringes or borders of velvet upon their gowns and petticoats under pain of fine or punishment because improper for their station and above their means the order appears to have been evaded for it was followed by another in february fifteen eighty which recapitulates these prohibitions and renders them more stringent End of footnote. there is a curious one against the iconoclasts or image breakers and picture destroyers for which the antiquary will hold her in high reverence her majesty informs us that several persons ignorant malicious or covetous of late years have spoiled and broken ancient monuments erected only to show a memory to posterity and not to nourish any kind of superstition the queen laments that what is broken and spoiled would be now hard to recover but advises her good people to repair them and commands them in future to desist from committing such injuries 
a more extraordinary circumstance than the proclamation itself was the manifestation of her majesty's zeal in subscribing her name with her own hand to every proclamation dispersed throughout england these image-breakers first appeared in elizabeth's reign it was afterwards that they flourished in all the perfection of their handicraft and have contrived that these monuments of art shall carry down to posterity the memory of their shame and of their age these image-breakers so famous in our history had already appeared under henry the eighth and continued their practical zeal in spite of proclamations and remonstrances till they had accomplished their work in sixteen forty one an order was published by the commons that they should take away all scandalous pictures out of churches but more was intended than was expressed and we are told that the people did not at first carry their barbarous practice against all art to the lengths which they afterwards did till they were instructed by private information dowsing's journal has been published and shows what the order meant he was their giant destroyer such are the machiavellian secrets of revolutionary governments they give a public order in moderate words but the secret one for the deeds is that of extermination it was this sort of men who discharged their prisoners by giving a secret sign to lead them to their execution the proclamations of james i by their number are said to have sunk their value with the people footnote the list of a very few of those issued at the early part of his reign may illustrate this in sixteen o four was published a proclamation for the true winding or folding of wools as well as one for the due regulation of prices of victuals within the verge of kent in sixteen hundred and five against certain calumnious surmises concerning the church government of scotland in sixteen hundred and eight a proclamation against making starch in sixteen hundred and twelve that none buy or sell any bullion of gold and silver at higher prices than is appointed to be paid for the same another against dyeing silk with slip or any corrupt stuff in sixteen hundred and thirteen for prohibiting the untimely bringing in of wines as well as for prohibiting the publishing of any reports or writings of duels and also the importation of felt hats or caps in sixteen hundred and fifteen prohibiting the making of glass with timber or wood because of late years the waste of wood in timber hath been exceeding great and intolerable by the glass houses and glass works of late in divers parts erected and which his majesty fears may have the effect of depriving england of timber to construct her navy End of footnote he was fond of giving them gentle advice and it is said by wilson that there was an intention to have this king's printed proclamations bound up in a volume that better notice might be taken of the matters contained in them there is more than one to warn the people against speaking too freely of matters above their reach prohibiting all undutiful speeches i suspect that many of these proclamations are the composition of the king's own hand he was often his own secretary there is an admirable one against private duels and challenges the curious one respecting cowell's interpreter is a sort of royal review of some of the arcana of state i refer to the quotation i will preserve a passage of a proclamation against excess of lavish and licentious speech james was a king of words although the commixture of nations confluence of ambassadors and the relation which the affairs of our kingdoms have had towards the business and interests of foreign states have caused during our regiment government a greater openness and liberty of discourse even concerning matters of state which are no themes or subjects fit for vulgar persons or common meetings than hath been in former times used or permitted and although in our own nature and judgment we do well allow of convenient freedom of speech esteeming any 
over curious or restrained hands carried in that kind rather as a weakness or else over much severity of government than otherwise yet for as much as it is come to our ears by common report that there is at this time a more licentious passage of lavish discourse and bold censure in matters of state than is fit to be suffered we give this warning etc to take heed how they intermeddle by pen or speech with causes of state and secrets of empire either at home or abroad but contain themselves within that modest and reverent regard of matters above their reach and calling or to give any manner of applause to such discourse without acquainting one of our privy council within the space of twenty-four hours it seems that the bold speakers as certain persons were then denominated practised an old artifice of lauding his majesty while they severely arraigned the councils of the cabinet on this james observes neither let any man mistake us so much as to think that by giving fair and specious attributes to our person they cover the scandals which they otherwise lay upon our government but conceive that we make no other construction of them but as fine and artificial glosses the better to give passage to the rest of their imputations and scandals this was a proclamation in the eighteenth year of his reign he repeated it in the nineteenth and he might have proceeded to the crack of doom with the same effect rushworth in his second volume of historical collections has preserved a considerable number of the proclamations of charles the first of which many are remarkable but latterly they mark the feverish state of his reign one regulates access for cure of the king's evil by which his majesty it appears hath had good success therein but though ready and willing as any king or queen of this realm ever was to relieve the distresses of his good subjects his majesty commands to change the seasons for his sacred touch from easter and whitsuntide to easter and michaelmas as times more convenient for the temperature of the season etc another against departure out of the realm without license one to erect an office for the suppression of cursing and swearing to receive the forfeitures against libelous and seditious pamphlets and discourses from scotland framed by factious spirits and republished in london this was in sixteen forty and charles at the crisis of that great insurrection in which he was to be at once the actor and the spectator fondly imagined that the possessors of these scandalous pamphlets would bring them as he proclaimed to one of his majesty's justices of peace to be by him sent to one of his principal secretaries of state on the restoration charles the second had to court his people by his domestic regulations he early issued a remarkable proclamation which one would think reflected on his favourite companions and which strongly marks the moral disorders of those depraved and wretched times it is against vicious debauched and profane persons who are thus described a sort of men of whom we have heard much and are sufficiently ashamed who spend their time in taverns tippling houses and debauches giving no other evidence of their affection to us but in drinking our health and inveighing against all others who are not of their own dissolute temper and who in truth have more discredited our cause by the license of their manners and lives than they could ever advance it by their affection or courage we hope all persons of honour or in place and authority will so far assist us in discountenancing such men that their discretion and shame will persuade them to reform what their conscience would not and that the displeasure of good men towards them may supply what the laws have not and it may be cannot well provide against there being by the license and corruption of the times and the depraved nature of man many enormities scandals and impieties in practice and manners which laws cannot well describe and consequently not enough provide against which may by the example and severity of virtuous men be easily discountenanced and by degrees suppressed surely the gravity and moral severity of clarendon dictated this proclamation which must have afforded some mirth to the gay debauched circle the loose cronies of royalty 
it is curious that in sixteen sixty charles the second issued a long proclamation for the strict observance of lent and alleges for it the same reason as we found in edward the sixth proclamation for the good it produces in the employment of fishermen no ordinaries taverns etc to make any supper on friday nights either in lent or out of lent charles the second issues proclamations to repress the excess of gilding of coaches and chariots to restrain the waste of gold which as they supposed by the excessive use of gilding had grown scarce against the exportation and the buying and selling of gold and silver at higher rates than in our mint alluding to a statute made in the ninth year of edward the third called the statute of money against building in and about london and westminster in sixteen sixty one the inconveniences daily growing by increase of new buildings are that the people increasing in such great numbers are not well to be governed by the wanted officers the prices of victuals are enhanced the health of the subject inhabiting the cities much endangered and many good towns and boroughs unpeopled and in their trades much decayed frequent fires occasioned by timber buildings it orders to build with brick and stone which would beautify make an uniformity in the buildings and which are not only more durable and safe against fire but by experience are found to be of little more if not less charge than the building with timber we must infer that by the general use of timber it had considerably risen in price while brick and stone not then being generally used became as cheap as wood footnote lilly the astrologer in his memoirs notes that thomas howard earl of arundel the famous collector of the arundelian marbles now at oxford brought over the new way of building with brick in the city greatly to the safety of the city and preservation of the wood of this nation End of footnote. the most remarkable proclamations of charles the second are those which concern the regulations of coffee-houses and one for putting them down footnote. this proclamation for the suppression of coffee-houses bears date december twenty sixteen seventy five and is dated to have been issued because the multitude of coffee-houses lately set up and kept within this kingdom and the great resort of idle and dissipated persons to them have produced very evil and dangerous effects particularly in spreading of rumours and inducing tradesmen to neglect their calling tending to the danger of the common weal by the idle waste of time and money it therefore orders all coffee-house keepers that they or any of them do not presume from and after the tenth day of january next ensuing to keep any public coffee-house or utter or sell by retail in his her or their house or houses to be spent or consumed within the same any coffee chocolate sherbet or tea as they will answer it at their utmost peril End of footnote. to restrain the spreading of false news and licentious talking of state and government the speakers and the hearers were made alike punishable this was highly resented as an illegal act by the friends of civil freedom who however succeeded in obtaining the freedom of the coffee-houses under the promise of not sanctioning treasonable speeches it was urged by the court lawyers as the high tory roger north tells us that the retailing coffee might be an innocent trade when not used in the nature of a common assembly to discourse of matters of state news and great persons as a means to discontent the people on the other side kennett asserted that the discontents existed before they met at the coffee-houses and that the proclamation was only intended to suppress an evil which was not to be prevented at this day we know which of those two historians exercised the truest judgment it was not the coffee-houses which produced political feeling but the reverse whenever government ascribes effects to a cause quite inadequate to produce them they are only seeking means to hide the evil which they are too weak to suppress End of section forty six Section 47 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. 
curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli true sources of secret history this is a subject which has been hitherto but imperfectly comprehended even by some historians themselves and has too often incurred the satire and even the contempt of those volatile spirits who play about the superficies of truth wanting the industry to view it on more than one side and those superficial readers who imagine that every tale is told when it is written secret history is the supplement of history itself and is its great corrector and the combination of secret with public history has in itself a perfection which each taken separately has not the popular historian composes a plausible rather than an accurate tale researches too fully detailed would injure the just proportions or crowd the bold design of the elegant narrative and facts presented as they occur would not adapt themselves to those theoretical writers of history who arrange events not in a natural but in a systematic order but in secret history we are more busied in observing what passes than in being told of it we are transformed into the contemporaries of the writers while we are standing on the vantage ground of their posterity and thus what to them appeared ambiguous to us has become unquestionable what was secret to them has been confided to us they mark the beginnings and we the ends from the fullness of their accounts we recover much which had been lost to us in the general views of history and it is by this more intimate acquaintance with persons and circumstances that we are enabled to correct the less distinct and sometimes the fallacious appearances in the page of the popular historian he who only views things in masses will have no distinct notion of any one particular he may be a fanciful or a passionate historian but he is not the historian who will enlighten while he charms but as secret history appears to deal in minute things its connection with great results is not usually suspected the circumstantiality of its story the changeable shadows of its character the redundance of its conversations and the many careless superfluities which egotism or vanity may throw out seem usually confounded with that small talk familiarity termed gossiping but the gossiping of a profound politician or a vivacious observer in one of their letters or in their memoirs often by a spontaneous stroke reveals the individual or by a simple incident unriddles a mysterious event we may discover the value of these pictures of human nature with which secret history abounds by an observation which occurred between two statesmen in office lord raby our ambassador apologized to lord bolingbroke then secretary of state for troubling him with the minuter circumstances which occurred in his conferences in reply the minister requests the ambassador to continue the same manner of writing and alleges an excellent reason those minute circumstances give very great light to the general scope and design of the persons negotiated with and i own that nothing pleases me more in that valuable collection of the cardinal d'ossat's letters than the naive descriptions which he gives of the looks gestures and even tones of voice of the persons he conferred with i regret to have to record the opinions of another noble author who has recently thrown out some degrading notions of secret history and particularly of the historians i would have silently passed by a vulgar writer superficial prejudiced and uninformed but as so many are yet deficient in correct notions of secret history it is but justice that their representatives should be heard before they are condemned his lordship says that of late the appetite for remains of all kinds has surprisingly increased a story repeated by the duchess of portsmouth's waiting-woman to lord rochester's valet forms the subject of investigation for a philosophical historian 
and you may hear of an assembly of scholars and authors discussing the validity of a piece of scandal invented by a maid of honour more than two centuries ago and repeated to an obscure writer by queen elizabeth's housekeeper it is a matter of the greatest interest to see the letters of every busy trifler yet who does not laugh at such men this is the attack but as if some half-truths like light through the cranny in a dark room had just darted in a stream of atoms over this scoffer at secret history he suddenly views his object with a very different appearance for his lordship justly concludes that it must be confessed however that knowledge of this kind is very entertaining and here and there among the rubbish we find hints that may give the philosopher a clue to important facts and afford to the moralist a better analysis of the human mind than a whole library of metaphysics the philosopher may well abhor all intercourse with wits because the faculty of judgment is usually quiescent with them and in their orgasm they furiously decry what in their sober senses they as eagerly laud let me inform his lordship that the waiting woman and the valet of eminent persons are sometimes no unimportant personages in history by the memoirs de mont de la porte premier valet de chambre de louis fourteenth we learn what before the valet wrote had not been known the shameful arts which mazarin allowed to be practised to give a bad education to the prince and to manage him by depraving his tastes madame de montville in her memoirs the waiting lady of our henrietta has preserved for our own english history some facts which have been found so essential to the narrative that they are referred to by our historians in guy joly the humble dependent of cardinal de retz we discover an unconscious but a useful commentator on the memoirs of his master and the most affecting personal antidotes of charles i have been preserved by thomas herbert his gentleman-in-waiting clary the valet of louis the sixteenth with pathetic faithfulness has shown us the man in the monarch whom he served of secret history there are obviously two species it is positive or it is relative it is positive when the facts are first given to the world a sort of knowledge which can only be drawn from our own personal experience or from contemporary documents preserved in their manuscript state in public or private collections or it is relative in proportion to the knowledge of those to whom it is communicated and will be more or less valued according to the acquisitions of the reader and this inferior species of secret history is drawn from rare and obscure books and other published authorities often as scarce as manuscripts some experience i have had in those literary researches were curiosity ever wakeful and vigilant discoverers among contemporary manuscripts new facts illustrations of old ones and sometimes detect not merely by conjecture the concealed causes of many events often opens a scene in which some well-known personage is exhibited in a new character and thus penetrates beyond those generalizing representations which satisfy the superficial and often cover the page of history with delusion and fiction it is only since the latter institution of natural libraries that these immense collections of manuscripts have been formed with us they are an indescribable variety usually classed under the vague title of state papers footnote two five two the large mass of important documents in the national state paper office has recently been made available to the use of the historic student with the best results and cannot fail to have important influence on the future historic literature of the country End of footnote. instructions of ambassadors but more particularly their own dispatches charters and chronicles brown with antiquity which preserve a world which had been else lost for us like the one before the deluge series upon series of private correspondence among which we discover the most confidential communications designed by the writers to have been destroyed by the hand which received them memoirs of individuals by themselves or by their friends 
such as now are published by the pomp of vanity or the faithlessness of their possessors and the miscellaneous collections formed by all kinds of persons characteristic of all countries and of all eras materials for the history of man records of the force or of the feebleness of the human understanding and still the monuments of their passions the original collectors of these dispersed manuscripts were a race of ingenious men silent benefactors of mankind to whom justice has not yet been fully awarded but in their fervour of accumulation everything in a manuscript state bore its spell acquisition was the sole point aimed at by our early collectors and to this these searching spirits sacrificed their fortunes their ease and their days but life would have been too short to have decided on the intrinsic value of the manuscripts flowing in a stream to the collectors and suppression even of the disjointed reveries of madmen or the sensible madness of projectors might have been indulging a capricious state or what has proved more injurious to historical pursuits that party feeling which has frequently annihilated the memorials of their adversaries these manuscripts now assume a formidable appearance a toilsome march over these alps rising over alps a voyage in a sea without a shore has turned away most historians from their severer duties those who have grasped at early celebrity have been satisfied to have given a new form to rather than contributed to the new matter of history the very sight of these masses of history has terrified some modern historians when pere daniel undertook a history of france the learned boivin the king's librarian opened for his inspection an immense treasure of charters and another of royal autograph letters and another of private correspondence treasures reposing in fourteen hundred folios the modern historian passed two hours impatiently looking over them but frightened at another plunge into the gulf this courteous of history would not immolate himself for his country he wrote a civil letter to the librarian for his supernumerary kindness but insinuated that he could write a very readable history without any further aid of such paper asses or paper rubbish pere daniel therefore quietly sat down to his history copying others a compliment which was never returned by any one but there was this striking novelty in his readable history that according to the accurate computation of count boulain villiers pere daniel's history of france contains ten thousand blenders the same circumstance has been told me by a living historian of the late gilbert stuart who on some manuscript volumes of letters being pointed out to him when composing his history of scotland confessed that what was already printed was more than he was able to read and thus much for his theoretical history written to run counter to another theoretical history being stuart versus robertson they equally depend on the simplicity of their readers and the charms of style another historian and queto the author of l'esprit de la ligue has described his embarrassment at an inspection of the contemporary manuscripts of that period after thirteen years of research to glean whatever secret history printed books afforded the author residing in the country resolved to visit the royal library at paris monsieur melon received him with that kindness which is one of the official duties of the public librarian towards the studious opened the cabinets in which were deposited the treasures of french history this is what you require come here at all times and you shall be attended said the librarian to the young historian who stood by with a sort of shudder while he opened cabinet after cabinet the intrepid investigator repeated his visits looking over the mass as chance directed attacking one side and then flying to another the historian who had felt no weariness during thirteen years among printed books discovered that he was now engaged in a task apparently always beginning and never ending the esprit de la ligue was however enriched by labours which at the moment appeared so barren the study of these paperasses 
is not perhaps so disgusting as the impatient pere daniel imagined there is a literary fascination in looking over the same papers which the great characters of history once held and wrote on catching from themselves their secret sentiments and often detecting so many of their unrecorded actions by habit the toil becomes light and with a keen inquisitive spirit even delightful for what is more delightful to the curious than to make fresh discoveries every day addison has a true and pleasing observation on such pursuits our employments are converted into amusements so that even in those objects which were indifferent or even displeasing to us the mind not only gradually loses its aversion but conceives a certain fondness and affection for them addison illustrates this case by one of the greatest geniuses of the age who by habit took incredible pleasure in searching into rolls and records till he preferred them to virgil and cicero the faculty of curiosity is as fervid and even as refined in its search after truth as that of taste in the object of imagination and the more it is indulged the more exquisitely it is enjoyed the popular historians of england and of france have in truth made little use of manuscript researches life is very short for long histories and those who rage with an avidity of fame or profit will gladly taste the fruit which they cannot mature researches too remotely sought after or too slowly acquired or too fully detailed would be so many obstructions in the smooth texture of a narrative our theoretical historians write from some particular and preconceived result unlike livy and de thou and machiavel who described events in their natural order these cluster them together by the fanciful threads of some political or moral theory by which facts are distorted displaced and sometimes altogether omitted one single original document has sometimes shaken into the dust their palladian edifice of history at the moment hume was sending some sheets of his history to press murden's state papers appeared and we are highly amused and instructed by a letter of our historian to his rival robertson who probably found himself often in the same forlorn situation our historian discovered in that collection what compelled him to retract his preconceived system he hurries to stop the press and paints his confusion and his anxiety with all the ingenious simplicity of his nature we are all in the wrong he exclaims of fume i have heard that certain manuscripts at the state paper office had been prepared for his inspection during a fortnight but he never could muster courage to pay his promised visit satisfied with the common accounts and the most obvious sources of history when librarian at the advocate's library where yet may be examined the books he used marked by his hand he spread the volumes about the sofa from which he rarely rose to pursue obscure inquiries or delay by fresh difficulties the page which every day was growing under his charming pen and striking proof of his careless happiness i discovered in his never referring to the perfect edition of whitelock's memorials of seventeen thirty two but to the old truncated and faithless ones of sixteen eighty two dr birch was a writer with no genius for composition but one to whom british history stands more indebted than to any superior author his incredible love of labour in transcribing with his own hand a large library of manuscripts from originals dispersed in public and in private repositories has enriched the british museum by thousands of the most authentic documents of genuine secret history he once projected a collection of original historical letters for which he had prepared a preface where i find the following passage it is a more important service to the public to contribute something not before known to the general fund of history than to give new form and colour to what we are already possessed of by superadding refinement and ornament which too often tend to disguise the real state of the facts a fault not to be atoned for by the pomp of style or even the fine eloquence of the historian this was an oblique stroke aimed at robertson to whom birch had generously opened the stores of history 
for the scotch historian had needed all his charity but robertson's attractive inventions and highly finished composition seduce the public taste and we may forgive the latent spark of envy in the honest feelings of the man who was profoundly skilled in delving in the native beds of ore but not in fashioning it and whose own neglected historical works constructed on the true principles of secret history we may often turn over to correct the erroneous the prejudiced and the artful accounts of those who have covered their faults by the pomp of style and the eloquence of the historian the large manuscript collections of original documents from whence may be drawn what i have called positive secret history are as i observed comparatively of modern existence formerly they were widely dispersed in private hands and the nature of such sources of historic discovery but rarely occurred to our writers even had they sought them their access must have been partial and accidental lord hardwick has observed that there are still many untouched manuscript collections within these kingdoms which through the ignorance or inattention of their owners are condemned to dust and obscurity but how valuable and essential they may be to the interests of authentic history and of sacred truth cannot be more strikingly demonstrated than in the recent publications of the marlborough and the shrewsbury papers by archdeacon cox footnote two five four the editor was fully authorized to observe it is singular that those transactions should either have passed over in silence or imperfectly represented by most of our national historians our modern history would have been a mere political romance without the astonishing picture of william and his ministers exhibited in those unquestionable documents burnett was among the first in our modern historians who showed the world the preciousness of such materials in his history of the reformation which he largely drew from the catonian collection our early historians only repeated a tale ten times told milton who wanted not for literary diligence had no fresh stores to open for his history of england while hume dispatches comparatively in a few pages a subject which has afforded to the fervent diligence of my learned friend sharon turner volumes precious to the antiquary the lawyer and the philosopher to illustrate my idea of the usefulness and of the absolute necessity of secret history i fix first on a public event and secondly on a public character both remarkable in our own modern history and both serving to expose the fallacious appearances of popular history by authorities indisputably genuine the event is the restoration of charles the second and the character is that of mary the queen of william the third in history the restoration of charles appears in all its splendour the king is joyfully received at dover and the shore is covered by his subjects on their knees crowds of the great hurry to canterbury the army is drawn up in number and with a splendour that had never been equalled his enthusiastic reception is on his birthday for that was the lucky day fixed on for his entrance into the metropolis in a word all that is told in history describes a monarch the most powerful and the most happy one of the tracts of the day entitled england's triumph in the mean quaintness of the style of the times tells us that the soldiery who had hitherto made clubs trump resolved now to enthrone the king of hearts turn to the faithful memorialist who so well knew the secrets of the king's heart and who was himself an actor behind the curtain turned to clarendon in his own life and we shall find that the power of the king was then as dubious as when he was an exile and his feelings were so much racked that he had nearly resolved on a last flight clarendon in noticing the temper and spirit of that time observes whoever reflects upon all this composition of contradictory wishes and expectations must confess that the king was not yet the master of the kingdom nor his authority and security such as the general noise and acclamation 
the bells and the bonfires proclaimed it to be the first mortification the king met with as soon as he arrived at canterbury within three hours after he landed at dover clarendon then relates how many the king found there who while they waited with joy to kiss his hand also came with importunate solicitations for themselves forced him to give them present audience in which they reckoned up the insupportable losses undergone by themselves or their fathers demanding some grant or promise of such or such offices some even for more pressing for two or three with such confidence in importunity and with such tedious discourses that the king was extremely nauseated with their suits though his modesty knew not how to break from them that he no sooner got into his chamber which for some hours he was not able to do than he lamented the condition to which he found he must be subject and did in truth from that minute contract such a prejudice against some of those persons but a greater mortification was to follow and one which had nearly thrown the king into despair general monk had from the beginning to this instant acted very mysteriously never corresponding with nor answering a letter of the king's so that his majesty was frequently doubtful whether the general designed to act for himself or for the king an ambiguous conduct which i attribute to the power his wife had over him who was in the opposite interest the general in his rough way presented him a large paper with about seventy names for his privy council of which not more than two were acceptable the king says clarendon was in more than ordinary confusion for he knew not well what to think of the general in whose absolute power he was so that at this moment his majesty was almost alarmed at the demand and appearance of things the general afterwards undid this unfavourable appearance by acknowledging that the list was drawn up by his wife who had made him promise to present it but he permitted his majesty to act as he thought proper at that moment general monk was more king than charles we have not yet concluded when charles met the army at blackheath fifty thousand strong he knew well the ill constitution of the army the distemper and murmuring that was in it and how many diseases and convulsions their infant loyalty was subject to that how united soever their inclinations and acclamations seemed to be at blackheath their affections were not the same and the very countenances there of many officers as well as soldiers did sufficiently manifest that they were drawn thither to a service they were not delighted in the old soldiers had little regard for their new officers and it quickly appeared by the select and affected mixtures of sullen and melancholic parties of officers and soldiers and then the chancellor of human nature adds and in this melancholic and perplexed condition the king and all his hopes stood when he appeared most gay and exalted and wore a pleasantness in his face that became him and looked like as full an assurance of his security as was possible to put on it is imagined that louis the eighteenth would be the ablest commentator on this piece of secret history and add another twin to pierre de saint julien's gemelle ou perellis an old french treatise of histories which resemble one another a volume so scarce that i have never met with it burnet informs us that when queen mary held the administration of government during the absence of william it was imagined by some that as every woman of sense loved to be meddling they concluded that she had but a small portion of it because she lived so abstracted from all affairs he praised her exemplary behaviour regular in her devotions much in her closet read a great deal was often busy at work and seemed to employ her time and thoughts in anything rather than matters of state her conversation was lively and obliging everything in her was easy and natural the king told the earl of shrewsbury that though he could not hit on the right way of pleasing england he was confident she would and that we should all be very happy under her such is the miniature of the queen which burnet offers we see nothing but her tranquillity her simplicity 
or carelessness amidst the important transactions passing under her eye but i lift the curtain from a larger picture the distracted state amidst which the queen lived the vexations the secret sorrows the agonies and the despair of mary in the absence of william nowhere appear in history and as we see escaped the ken of the scotch bishop they were reserved for the curiosity and instruction of posterity and were found by dalrymple in the letters of mary to her husband in king william's cabinet it will be well to place under the eye of the reader the suppressed cries of this afflicted queen at the time when everything in her was so easy and natural employing her time and thoughts in anything rather than matters of state often busy at work i shall not dwell on the pangs of the queen for the fate of william or her deadly suspicions that many were unfaithful about her a battle lost might have been fatal a conspiracy might have undone what even a victory had obtained the continual terrors she endured were such that we might be at a loss to determine who suffered most those who had been expelled from or those who had ascended to the throne so far was the queen from not employing her thoughts on matters of state that every letter usually written towards evening chronicles the conflict of the day she records not only events but even dialogues and personal characteristics hints her suspicions and multiplies her fears her attention was incessant i never write but what i think others do not and her terrors were as ceaseless i pray god send you back quickly for i see all breaking out into flames the queen's difficulties were not eased by a single confidential intercourse on one occasion she observes as i do not know what i ought to speak and when not i am as silent as can be i ever fear not doing well and trust to what nobody says but you it seems to me that every one is afraid of themselves i am very uneasy in one thing which is want of somebody to speak my mind freely to for it's a great constraint to think and be silent and there is so much matter that i am one of solomon's fools who am ready to burst i must tell you again how lord monmouth endeavours to frighten me and indeed things have but a melancholy prospect she had indeed reasons to fear lord monmouth who it appears divulged all the secrets of the royal councils to major wildman who was one of our old republicans and to spread alarm in the privy council conveyed in lemon juice all their secrets to france often on the very day they had passed in council they discovered the fact and every one suspected the others as a traitor lord lincoln even once assured her that the lord president and all in general who are in trust were rogues her council was composed of factions and the queen's suspicions were rather general than particular for she observes on them till now i thought you had given me wrong characters of men but now i see they answer my expectation of being as little of a mind as of a body for a final extract take this full picture of royal misery i must seek company on my set days i must play twice a week nay i must laugh and talk though never so much against my will i believe i dissemble very ill to those who know me at least it is a great constraint to myself yet i must endure it all my motions are so watched and all i do so observed that if i eat less or speak less or look more grave all is lost in the opinion of the world so that i have this misery added to that of your absence that i must grin when my heart is ready to break and talk when my heart is so oppressed that i can scarce breathe i go to kensington as often as i can for air but then i can never be quite alone neither can i complain that would be some ease but i have nobody whose humour and circumstances agree with mine enough to speak my mind freely to besides i must hear of business which being a thing i am so new in and so unfit for does but break my brains the more and not ease my heart thus different from the representation of burnett was the actual state of queen mary and i suspect that our warm and vehement 
bishop had but little personal knowledge of her majesty notwithstanding the elaborate character of the queen which he has given in her funeral eulogium he must have known that she did not always sympathize with his party feelings for the queen writes the bishop of salisbury has made a long thundering sermon this morning which he has been with me to desire to print which i could not refuse though i should not have ordered it for reasons which i told him burnet who i am very far from calling what an inveterate tory edward earl of oxford does in one of his manuscript notes that lying scot unquestionably has told many truths in his gargulous page but the cause in which he stood so deeply engaged coupled to his warm sanguine temper may have sometimes dimmed his sagacity so as to have caused him to have mistaken as in the present case a mask for a face particularly at a time when almost every individual appears to have worn one both these cases of charles the second and queen mary show the absolute necessity of researches into secret history to correct the appearances and the fallacies which so often deceive us in public history the appetite for remains as the noble author whom i have already alluded to calls it may then be a very wholesome one if it provide the only materials by which our popular histories can be corrected and since it often infuses a freshness into a story which after having been copied from book to book inspires another to tell it for the tenth time thus are the sources of secret history unsuspected by the idler and the superficial among those masses of untouched manuscripts that subterraneous history which indeed may terrify the indolent bewilder the inexperienced and confound the injudicious if they have not acquired the knowledge which not only decides on facts and opinions but on the authorities which have furnished them popular historians have written to their readers each with different views but all alike form the open documents of history like feed advocates they declaim or like special pleaders they keep only on one side of their case they are seldom zealous to push on their cross-examination for they come to gain their cause and not to hazard it time will make the present age as obsolete as the last for our sons will cast a new light over the ambiguous scenes which distract their fathers they will know how some things happened for which we cannot account they will bear witness to how many characters we have mistaken they will be told many of those secrets which our contemporaries hide from us they will pause at the ends of our beginnings they will read the perfect story of man which can never be told while it is proceeding all this is the possession of posterity because they will judge without our passions and all this we ourselves have been enabled to possess by the secret history of the last two ages footnote two five five since this article has been sent to press i rise from reading one in the edinburgh review on lord orford's and lord waldgrave's memoirs this is one of the very rare articles which could only come from the hand of a master long exercised in the studies he criticizes the critic or rather the historian observes that of a period remarkable for the establishment of our present system of government no authentic materials had yet appeared events of public notoriety are to be found though often inaccurately told in our common histories but the secret springs of action their private views and motives of individuals and see are as little known to us as if the events to which they relate had taken place in china or japan the clear connected dispassionate and circumstantial narrative with which he has enriched the stores of english history is drawn from the sources of secret history from published memoirs and contemporary correspondence end of footnotes end of section forty seven Section 48 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by bruce peary curiosities of literature volume 3 by isaac disraeli literary residences men of genius have usually been condemned to compose their finest works which are usually their earliest ones under the roof of a garret and few literary characters have lived like pliny and voltaire in a villa or chateau of their own it has not therefore often happened that a man of genius could raise local emotions by his own intellectual suggestions ariosto who built a palace in his verse lodged himself in a small house and found that stanzas and stones were not put together at the same rate old montaigne has left a description of his library over the entrance of my house where i view my courtyards and garden and at once survey all the operations of my family there is however a feeling among literary men of building up their own elegant fancies and giving a permanency to their own tastes we dwell on their favorite scenes as a sort of portraits and we eagerly collect those few prints which are their only vestiges a collection might be formed of such literary residences chosen for their amenity and their retirement and adorned by the objects of their studies from that of the younger pliny who called his villa of literary leisure by the endearing term of Willila, to that of cassiodorus the prime minister of theodoric who has left so magnificent a description of his literary retreat where all the elegancies of life were at hand where the gardeners and the agriculturists labored on scientific principles and where amidst gardens and parks stood his extensive library with scribes to multiply his manuscripts from tycho brahes who built a magnificent astronomical house on an island which he named after the sole objects of his musings uranianborough or the castle of the heavens to that of evelyn who first began to adorn wotton by building a little study till many years after he dedicated the ancient house to contemplation among the delicious streams and venerable woods the gardens the fountains and the groves most tempting for a great person and a wanton purse and indeed gave one of the first examples to that elegancy since so much in vogue from pope whose little garden seemed to multiply its scenes by a glorious union of nobility and literary men conversing in groups down to lonely shenstone whose rural elegance as he entitles one of his odes compelled him to mourn over his hard fate when expense had lavished thousand ornaments and taught convenience to perplex him art to pall pomp to deject and beauty to displease we have all by heart the true and delightful reflection of johnson on local associations when the scene we tread suggests to us the men or the deeds which have left their celebrity to the spot we are in the presence of their fame and feel its influence a literary friend whom a hint of mine had induced to visit the old tower in the garden of buffon where the sage retired every morning to compose passed so long a time in that lonely apartment as to have raised some solicitude among the honest folks of montbar who having seen the englishman enter but not return during a heavy thunderstorm which had occurred in the interval informed the good mayor who came in due form to notify the ambiguous state of the stranger my friend is as is well known a genius of that cast who could pass two hours in the tower of buffon without being aware that he had been all that time occupied by suggestions of ideas and reveries which in some minds such a locality may excite he was also busied with his pencil for he has favored me with two drawings of the interior and the exterior of this old tower in the garden the nakedness within can only be compared to the solitude without such was the studying-room of buffon where his eye resting on no object never interrupted the unity of his meditations on nature 
in return for my friend's kindness it has cost me i think two hours in attempting to translate the beautiful picture of this literary retreat which vic d'azir has finished with all the warmth of a votary at montbar in the midst of an ornamented garden is seen an antique tower it was there that buffon wrote the history of nature and from that spot his fame spread through the universe there he came at sunrise and no one however importunate was suffered to trouble him the calm of the morning hour the first warbling of the birds the varied aspect of the country all at that moment which touched the senses recalled him to his model free independent he wandered in his walks there was he seen with quickened or with slow steps or standing wrapped in thought sometimes with his eyes fixed on the heavens in the moment of inspiration as if satisfied with the thought that so profoundly occupied his soul sometimes collected within himself he sought what would not always be found or at the moments of producing he wrote he effaced and rewrote to efface once more thus he harmonized in silence all the parts of his composition which he frequently repeated to himself till satisfied with his corrections he seemed to repay himself for the pains of his beautiful prose by the pleasure he found in declaiming it aloud thus he engraved it in his memory and would recite it to his friends or induce some to read it to him at those moments he was himself a severe judge and would again recompose it desirous of attaining to that perfection which is denied to the impatient writer a curious circumstance connected with local associations occurred to that extraordinary oriental student Fourmont. originally he belonged to a religious community and never failed in performing his offices but he was expelled by the superior for an irregularity of conduct not likely to have become contagious through the brotherhood he frequently prolonged his studies far into the night and it was possible that the house might be burnt by such superfluity of learning fourmont retreated to the college of montaigne where he occupied the very chambers which had formerly been those of erasmus a circumstance which contributed to excite his emulation and to hasten his studies he who smiles at the force of such emotions only proves that he has not experienced what are real and substantial as the scene itself for those who are concerned in them pope who had far more enthusiasm in his poetical disposition than is generally understood was extremely susceptible of the literary associations with localities one of the volumes of his homer was begun and finished in an old tower over the chapel of stanton harcourt footnote the room is a small wainscoted apartment in the second floor commanding a pleasant view End of footnote. and he has perpetuated the event if not consecrated the place by scratching with a diamond on a pane of stained glass this inscription in the year seventeen eighteen alexander pope finished here the f blank fifth volume of homer footnote the above inscription is a facsimile of that upon the glass the word fifth in the third line has been erased by pope for want of room to complete it properly it is scratched on a small pane of red glass and has been removed to newnham courtney the seat of the harcourt family on the banks of the thames a few miles from oxford End of footnote. it was the same feeling which induced him one day when taking his usual walk with hart in the haymarket to desire hart to enter a little shop where going up three pair of stairs into a small room pope said in this garret addison wrote his campaign nothing less than a strong feeling impelled the poet to ascend this garret it was a consecrated spot to his eye and certainly a curious instance of the power of genius contrasted with its miserable locality addison 
whose mind had fought through a campaign in a garret could he have called about him the pleasures of imagination had probably planned a house of literary repose where all parts would have been in harmony with his mind such residences of men of genius have been enjoyed by some and the vivid descriptions which they have left us convey something of the delightfulness which charmed their studious repose the italian paul jovius has composed more than three hundred concise eulogies of statesmen warriors and literary men of the fourteenth fifteenth and sixteenth centuries but the occasion which induced him to compose them is perhaps more interesting than the compositions jovius had a villa situated on a peninsula bordered by the lake of como it was built on the ruins of the villa of pliny and in his time the foundations were still visible when the surrounding lake was calm the sculptured marbles the trunks of columns and the fragments of those pyramids which had once adorned the residence of the friend of trajan were still viewed in its lucid bosom jovius was the enthusiast of literature and the leisure which it loves he was an historian with the imagination of a poet and though a christian prelate almost a worshipper of the sweet fictions of pagan mythology and when his pen was kept pure from satire or adulation to which it was too much accustomed it became a pencil he paints with rapture his gardens bathed by the waters of the lake the shade and freshness of his woods his green slopes his sparkling fountains the deep silence and calm of his solitude a statue was raised in his gardens to nature in his hall stood a fine statue of apollo and the muses around with their attributes his library was guarded by a mercury and there was an apartment adorned with doric columns and with pictures of the most pleasing subjects dedicated to the graces such was the interior without the transparent lake here spread its broad mirror and there was seen luminously winding by banks covered with olives and laurels in the distance towns promontories hills rising in an amphitheatre blushing with vines and the first elevation of the alps covered with woods and pasture and sprinkled with herds and flocks it was in a central spot of this enchanting habitation that a cabinet or gallery was erected where jovius had collected with prodigal cost the portraits of celebrated men and it was to explain and to describe the characteristics of these illustrious names that he had composed his eulogies this collection became so remarkable that the great men his contemporaries presented our literary collector with their own portraits among whom the renowned fernandez cortes sent jovius his before he died and probably others who were less entitled to enlarge the collection but it is equally probable that our caustic jovius would throw them aside our historian had often to describe men more famous than virtuous sovereigns politicians poets and philosophers men of all ranks countries and ages formed a crowded scene of men of genius or of celebrity sometimes a few lines compress their character and sometimes a few pages excite his fondness if he sometimes adulates the living we may pardon the illusions of a contemporary but he has the honour of satirising some by the honest freedom of a pen which occasionally broke out into premature truths such was the inspiration of literature and leisure which had embellished the abode of jovius and had raised in the midst of the lake of como a cabinet of portraits a noble tribute to those who are the salt of the earth we possess prints of rubens's house at antwerp that princely artist perhaps first contrived for his studio the circular apartment with a dome like the rotunda of the pantheon where the light descending from an aperture or window at the top sent down a single equal light that perfection of light which distributes its magical effects on the objects beneath footnote 
harrowens published in sixteen eighty four a series of interesting views of the house and some of the apartments including this domed one the series are upon one folio sheet now very rare End of footnote. bellori describes it una stanza rotonda con un solo occhio in cima the solo occhio is what the french term oeil de boeuf we ourselves want this single eye in our technical language of art this was his precious museum where he had collected a vast number of books which were intermixed with his marbles statues cameos intaglios and all that variety of the riches of art which he had drawn from rome but the walls did not yield in value for they were covered by pictures of his own composition or copies by his own hand made at venice and madrid of titian and paul veronese footnote rubens was an ardent collector and lost no chance of increasing his stores in the appendix to carpenter's pictorial notices of van dyck is printed the correspondence between himself and sir d carleton offering to exchange some of his own pictures for antiques in possession of the latter who was ambassador from england to holland and who collected also for the earl of arundel End of footnote. no foreigners men of letters or lovers of the arts or even princes would pass through antwerp without visiting the house of rubens to witness the animated residence of genius and the great man who had conceived the idea yet great as was his mind and splendid as were the habits of his life he could not resist the entreaties of the hundred thousand florins of our duke of buckingham to dispose of this studio the great artist could not however abandon for ever the delightful contemplations he was depriving himself of and as substitutes for the miracles of art he had lost he solicited and obtained leave to replace them by casts which were scrupulously deposited in the places where the originals had stood of this feeling of the local residences of genius the italians appear to have been not perhaps more susceptible than other people but more energetic in their enthusiasm florence exhibits many monuments of this sort in the neighborhood of santa maria novella zimmermann has noticed a house of the celebrated viviani which is a singular monument of gratitude to his illustrious master galileo the front is adorned with the bust of this father of science and between the windows are engraven accounts of the discoveries of galileo it is the most beautiful biography of genius yet another still more eloquently excites our emotions the house of michelangelo his pupils in perpetual testimony of their admiration and gratitude have ornamented it with all the leading features of his life the very soul of this vast genius put in action this is more than biography it is living as with a contemporary End of section forty eight section forty nine of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli whether allowable to ruin oneself the political economist replies that it is one of our old dramatic writers who witnessed the singular extravagance of dress among the modellers of fashion our nobility condemns their superfluous bravery echoing the popular cry there are a sort of men whose coining heads are mints of all new fashions that have done more hurt to the kingdom by superfluous bravery which the foolish gentry imitate than a war or a long famine all the treasure by this foul excess is got into the merchants embroiderers silkmen's jewellers tailors hands and the third part of the land too the nobility engrossing titles only our poet might have been startled at the reply of our political economist 
if the nobility in follies such as these only preserved their titles while their lands were dispersed among the industrious classes the people were not sufferers the silly victims ruining themselves by their excess of luxury or their costly dress as it appears some did was an evil which left to its own course must check itself if the rich did not spend the poor would starve luxury is the cure of that unavoidable evil in society great inequality of fortune political economists therefore tell us that any regulations would be ridiculous which as lord bacon expresses it should serve for the repressing of waste and excess by sumptuary laws adam smith is not only indignant at sumptuary laws but asserts with a democratic insolence of style that it is the highest impertinence and presumption in kings and ministers to pretend to watch over the economy of private people and to restrain their expense by sumptuary laws they are themselves always the greatest spendthrifts in the society let them look well after their own expense and they may safely trust private people with theirs if their own extravagance does not ruin the state that of their subjects never will we must therefore infer that governments by extravagance may ruin a state but that individuals enjoy the remarkable privilege of ruining themselves without injuring society adam smith afterwards distinguishes two sorts of luxury the one exhausting itself in durable commodities as in buildings furniture books statues pictures will increase the opulence of a nation but of the other wasting itself in dress and equipages in frivolous ornaments jewels baubles trinkets etc he acknowledges no trace or vestige would remain and the effects of ten or twenty years profusion would be as completely annihilated as if they had never existed there is therefore a greater and a lesser evil in this important subject of the opulent unrestricted by any law ruining his whole generation where the wealth of nations is made the solitary standard of their prosperity it becomes a fertile source of errors in the science of morals and the happiness of the individual is then too frequently sacrificed to what is called the prosperity of the state if an individual in the pride of luxury and selfism annihilates the fortunes of his whole generation untouched by the laws as a criminal he leaves behind him a race of the discontented and the seditious who having sunk in the scale of society have to reascend from their degradation by industry and by humiliation but for the work of industry their habits have made them inexpert and to humiliation their very rank presents a perpetual obstacle sumptuary laws so often enacted and so often repealed and always eluded were the perpetual but ineffectual attempts of all governments to restrain what perhaps cannot be restrained criminal folly and to punish a man for having ruined himself would usually be to punish a most contrite penitent it is not surprising that before private vices were considered as public benefits the governors of nations instituted sumptuary laws for the passion for pageantry and an incredible prodigality in dress were continually impoverishing great families more equality of wealth has now rather subdued the form of private ruin than laid this evil domestic spirit the incalculable expenditure and the blaze of splendor of our ancestors may startle the incredulity of our elegant we find men of rank exhausting their wealth and pawning their castles and then desperately issuing from them heroes for a crusade or brigands for their neighborhood and this frequently from the simple circumstance of having for a short time maintained some gorgeous chivalric festival on their own estates or from having melted thousands of acres into cloth of gold their sons were left to beg their bread on the estates which they were to have inherited 
it was when chivalry still charmed the world by the remains of its seductive splendors towards the close of the fifteenth century that i find an instance of this kind occurring in the pas de sandricourt which was held in the neighborhood of the sieur of that name it is a memorable affair not only for us curious inquirers after manners and morals but for the whole family of the sandricourts for though the said sieur is now receiving the immortality we bestow on him and la dame who presided in that magnificent piece of chivalry was infinitely gratified yet for ever after was the lord of sandricourt ruined and all for a short romantic three months this story of the chivalric period may amuse a pas d'armes though consisting of military exercises and deeds of gallantry was a sort of festival distinct from a tournament it signified a pas or passage to be contested by one or more knights against all comers it was necessary that the road should be such that it could not be passed without encountering some guardian knight the chevaliers who disputed the pas hung their blazoned shields on trees pales or posts raised for this purpose the aspirants after chivalric honors would strike with their lance one of these shields and when it rung it instantly summoned the owner to the challenge a bridge or a road would sometimes serve for this military sport for such it was intended to be whenever the heat of the rivals proved not too earnest the sieur of sandricourt was a fine dreamer of feats of chivalry and in the neighbourhood of his castle he fancied that he saw a very spot adapted for every game there was one admirably fitted for the barrier of a tilting match another embellished by a solitary pine tree another which was called the meadow of the thorn there was a carrefour where in four roads four knights might meet and above all there was a forest called Duvoyable, having no path so favourable for errant knights who might there enter for strange adventures and as chance directed encounter others as bewildered as themselves our chivalric sandricourt found nine young seigneurs of the court of charles the eighth of france who answered all his wishes to sanction this glorious feat it was necessary to obtain leave from the king and a herald of the duke of orleans to distribute the cartel or challenge all over france announcing that from such a day ten young lords would stand ready to combat in those different places in the neighbourhood of sandricourt's chateau the names of this flower of chivalry have been faithfully registered and they were such as instantly to throw a spark into the heart of every lover of arms the world of fashion that is the chivalric world were set in motion four bodies of assailants soon collected each consisting of ten combatants the herald of orleans having examined the arms of these gentlemen and satisfied himself of their ancient lineage and their military renown admitted their claims to the proffered honor sandricourt now saw with rapture the numerous shields of the assailants placed on the sides of his portals and corresponding with those of the challengers which hung above them ancient lords were elected judges of the feats of the knights accompanied by the ladies for whose honour only the combatants declared they engaged the herald of orleans tells the history in no very intelligible verse but the burthen of his stanza is still du pas d'armes du chasteau sandricourt he sings or says Anc, depuis le temps du roi artu ne furent tant les armes exaucées mais chevalier et preux entreprenant prince plusieurs en terre déplacée pour y venir donner coups et pousser qui ont été là tenus si de cour que par force non prise et passé les barrières entré et passé du pas des armes du chasteau sandricourt doubtless there many a roland met with his oliver and could not pass the barriers cased as they were in steel de pied en cap we presume that they could not materially injure themselves yet when on foot 
the ancient judges discovered such symptoms of peril that on the following day they advised our knights to satisfy themselves by fighting on horseback against this prudential counsel for some time they protested as an inferior sort of glory however on the next day the horse combat was appointed in the carrefour by the pine tree on the following day they tried their lances in the meadow of the thorn but though on horseback the judges deemed their attacks were so fierce that this assault was likewise not without peril for some horses were killed and some knights were thrown and lay bruised by their own mail but the barbed horses wearing only des chanfreins headpieces magnificently caparisoned found no protection in their ornaments the last days were passed in combats of two to two or in a single encounter afoot in the forêt de voyable these jousts passed without any accident and the prizes were awarded in a manner equally gratifying to the claimants the last day of the festival was concluded with a most sumptuous banquet two noble knights had undertaken the humble office of maitre d'hôtel and while the knights were parading in the forêt de voyable seeking adventures a hundred servants were seen at all points carrying white and red hippocrates and juleps and syrup de violar sweetmeats and other spiceries to comfort these wanderers who on returning to the chasteau found a grand and plenteous banquet the tables were crowded in the court apartment where some held one hundred and twelve gentlemen not including the dames and the demoiselles in the halls and outside of the chasteau were other tables at that festival more than two thousand persons were magnificently entertained free of every expense their attendants their armourers their plumaciers and others were also present la dame de sandricourt fou multes d'avoir donné dans son chasteau si belle si magnifique et gorgias fête historians are apt to describe their personages as they appear not as they are if the lady of the sieur sandricourt really was multes during these gorgeous days one cannot but sympathize with the lady when her loyal knight and spouse confessed to her after the departure of the mob of two thousand visitors neighbors soldiers and courtiers the knight's challengers and the knight's assailants and the fine scenes at the pine tree the barrier in the meadow of the thorn and the horse combat at the carrefour and the jousts in the forêt de voyable the carousels in the castle halls the jollity of the banquet tables the morescos danced till they were reminded how the waning night grew old in a word when the costly dream had vanished that he was a ruined man for ever by immortalizing his name in one grand chivalric festival the sieur de sandricourt like a great torch had consumed himself in his own brightness and the very land on which the famous pas de sandricourt was held had passed away with it thus one man sinks generations by that wastefulness which a political economist would assure us was committing no injury to society the moral evil goes for nothing in financial statements similar instances of ruinous luxury we may find in the prodigal costliness of dress through the reigns of elizabeth james i and charles i not only in their massy grandeur they outweighed us but the accumulation and variety of their wardrobe displayed such a gaiety of fancy in their colours and their ornaments that the drawing-room in those days must have blazed at their presence and changed colours as the crowd moved but if we may trust to royal proclamations the ruin was general among some classes elizabeth issued more than one proclamation against the excess of apparel and among other evils which the government imagined this passion for dress occasioned it notices the wasting and undoing of a great number of young gentlemen otherwise serviceable and that others seeking by show of apparel to be esteemed as gentlemen and allured by the vain show of these things not only consume their goods and lands but also run into such debts and shifts 
as they cannot live out of danger of laws without attempting of unlawful acts the queen bids her own household to look unto it for good example to the realm and all noblemen archbishops and bishops all mayors justices of peace etc should see them executed in their private households the greatest difficulty which occurred to regulate the wear of apparel was ascertaining the incomes of persons or in the words of the proclamation finding that it is very hard for any man's state of living and value to be truly understood by other persons they were to be regulated as they appear cessed in the subsidy books but if persons chose to be more magnificent in their dress they were allowed to justify their means in that case if allowed her majesty would not be the loser for they were to be rated in the subsidy books according to such values as they themselves offered as a qualification for the splendour of their dress in my researches among manuscript letters of the times i have had frequent occasion to discover how persons of considerable rank appear to have carried their acres on their backs and with their ruinous and fantastical luxuries sadly pinched their hospitality it was this which so frequently cast them into the nets of the goldsmiths and other trading usurers at the coronation of james i i find a simple knight whose cloak cost him five hundred pounds but this was not uncommon footnote the famous puritanic writer philip stubbs who published his anatomy of abuses in fifteen ninety three declares that he has heard of shirts that have cost some ten shillings some twenty some forty some five pound some twenty nobles and which is horrible to hear some ten pound apiece his book is filled with similar denunciations of abuses in which he is followed by other satirists they appear to have produced little effect in the way of reformation for in the days of james i john taylor the water poet similarly laments the wastefulness of those who wear a farm in shoe-strings edged with gold and spangled garters worth a copy hold a hose and doublet which a lordship cost a gaudy cloak three manners price almost a beaver band and feather for the head priced at the church's tithe the poor man's bread End of footnote. at the marriage of elizabeth the daughter of james i lady wotton had a gown of which the embroidery cost fifty pounds a yard the lady arabella made four gowns one of which cost fifteen hundred pounds the lord montacute montague bestowed fifteen hundred pounds in apparel for his two daughters one lady under the rank of baroness was furnished with jewels exceeding one hundred thousand pounds and the lady arabella goes beyond her says the letter-writer all this extreme costs and riches makes us all poor as he imagined footnote it is not unusual to find in inventories of this era the household effects rated at much less than the wearing apparel of the person whose property is thus valued End of footnote. i have been amused in observing grave writers of state dispatches jocular on any mischance or mortification to which persons are liable whose happiness entirely depends on their dress sir dudley carleton our minister at venice communicates as an article worth transmitting the great disappointment incurred by sir thomas glover who was just come hither and had appeared one day like a comet all in crimson velvet and beaten gold but had all his expectations marred on a sudden by the news of prince henry's death a similar mischance from a different cause was the lot of lord hay who made great preparations for his embassy to france which however were chiefly confined to his dress he was to remain there twenty days and the letter-writer maliciously observes that he goes with twenty special suits of apparel for so many days abode besides his travelling robes but news is very lately come that the french have lately altered their fashion 
whereby he must needs be out of countenance if he be not set out after the last edition to find himself out of fashion with twenty suits for twenty days was a mischance his lordship had no right to count on the glass of fashion was unquestionably held up by two very eminent characters raleigh and buckingham and the authentic facts recorded of their dress will sufficiently account for the frequent proclamations to control that servile herd of imitators the smaller gentry there is a remarkable picture of sir walter which will at least serve to convey an idea of the gaiety and splendour of his dress it is a white satin pinked vest close sleeved to the wrist over the body a brown doublet finely flowered and embroidered with pearl in the feather of his hat a large ruby and pearl drop at the bottom of the sprig in place of a button his trunk or breeches with his stockings and ribbon garters fringed at the end all white and buff shoes with white ribbon oldus who saw this picture has thus described the dress of raleigh but i have some important additions for i find that raleigh's shoes on great court days were so gorgeously covered with precious stones as to have exceeded the value of six thousand six hundred pounds and that he had a suit of armour of solid silver with sword and belt blazing with diamonds rubies and pearls whose value was not so easily calculated raleigh had no patrimonial inheritance at this moment he had on his back a good portion of a spanish galleon and the profits of a monopoly of trade he was carrying on with the newly discovered virginia probably he placed all his hopes in his dress the virgin queen when she issued proclamations against the excess of apparel pardoned by her looks that promise of a mine which blazed in raleigh's and parsimonious as she was forgot the three thousand changes of dresses which she herself left in the royal wardrobe buckingham could afford to have his diamonds tacked so loosely on that when he chose to shake a few off on the ground he obtained all the fame he desired from the pickers-up who were generally les dames de la cour for our duke never condescended to accept what he himself had dropped his cloaks were trimmed with great diamond buttons and diamond hat-bands cockades and ear-rings yoked with great ropes and knots of pearls this was however but for ordinary dances he had twenty-seven suits of clothes made the richest that embroidery lace silk velvet silver gold and gems could contribute one of which was a white uncut velvet set all over both suit and cloak with diamonds valued at fourscore thousand pounds besides a great feather stuck all over with diamonds as were also his sword girdle hat and spurs footnote the jesuit draxelius in one of his religious dialogues notices the fact but i am referring to a harleian manuscript which confirms the information of the jesuit End of footnote. in the masks and banquets with which buckingham entertained the court he usually expended for the evening from one to five thousand pounds to others i leave to calculate the value of money the sums of this gorgeous wastefulness it must be recollected occurred before this million age of ours if to provide the means for such enormous expenditure buckingham multiplied the grievances of monopolies if he pillaged the treasury for his eighty thousand pounds coat if raleigh was at length driven to his last desperate enterprise to relieve himself of his creditors for a pair of six thousand pounds shoes in both these cases as in that of the chivalric sandricourt the political economist may perhaps acknowledge that there is a sort of luxury highly criminal all the arguments he may urge all the statistical accounts he may calculate and the healthful state of his circulating medium among the merchants embroiderers silkmen and jewellers will not alter such a moral evil which leaves an eternal taint 
on the wealth of nations it is the principle that private vices are public benefits and that men may be allowed to ruin their generations without committing any injury to society End of section 49